Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. Uh, Alex is down with another snake curse that seems to hit him every, you know, few years. So we're going to wish him the best of luck today. But I am actually not alone today. I am very happy to be joined by Tristan Zimmerman, uh, the creator of Making History, three one-session RPGs. Tristan, thank you for being on the show. Nonsense. Thank you, Nathan. I am delighted to be here. Well, I am uh, delighted to have you because when you had contacted me and uh, told me about what uh, what your Kickstarter was going to be about, I looked at it and I thought to myself, well, now this is, is very different than what I'm used to, and that always interests me. It's actually like, it, it's a historical, well, I guess the name pretty much says that all. Kind of like taking history and applying it to, to role-playing games. Could you, could you explain a little bit more? Sure. So uh, Making History is a collection of three one-session role-playing games. Uh, each of the three games in the book uh, has a complete adventure, uh, one-session adventure, uh, six pre-generated characters, and a very simple rule set designed specifically for that adventure. So all three parts of the game uh, are designed from the ground up to to mesh together and work specifically with one another. Uh, the three games, so uh, the first one, uh, mm. Norse Ivory, is set in the year 994 AD. You play as uh, Normans, the, the Frenchified descendants of uh, Vikings who conquered and settled in northern France. Uh, and you are going, open scare quotes, home, close scare quotes. Sure. Uh, to the frozen lands of your pagan ancestors uh, who despise you for abandoning Norse religion and culture. Game two, A Killing in Cahokia, is a murder mystery. It's a detective story set in the real historical Native American city of Cahokia, uh, which was uh, in 1100 when the, the game is set, l was larger than, than London was at the time. And in the process of investigating this wow. murder, uh, you will get in uh, over your head very quickly. Uh, mm. And then the, the third game, Darkened Ship, is set in the modern day, and you play as uh, junior sailors in the U.S. Navy, super green, fresh out of boot camp and follow-on schools, just arrived on your very first ship, uh, and you wake up one morning on a ship that should have 3,000 people aboard mm. uh, to discover that you are alone. And that game oh. kind of straddles the boundary between thriller and horror. Uh, they're all super fun. Uh, they're all really easy to prep. Uh, only only one to two hours, and that includes printing out character sheets. Uh, so it's it's really perfect for one of those sessions when um, you know you're getting together for game night, and two hours uh, ahead of time, Susan texts everybody to say, uh, "Hey, I'm not going to be able to make it this week," and you you don't want to run the regular campaign without her. No problem. Mm -hmm. Bust out the book. You're ready to go. Uh, everybody can have a really awesome game night uh, yeah. with with minimal prep. Excellent. Yeah, and and then it's about three to four hours to actually run run the scenario. Basically. Yes, that's correct. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, I have some questions about that because I was looking at those three descriptors that you gave, and uh, a lot of questions like really jumped to mind. The first one is really why did you want to take those three specific stories for this book? These stories were picked not because I said, uh, hey, I want to do, do three stories. Let me go find the perfect story. Hmm. Um, you know, hey, I think Kahokia would do a good job. Let me dig into Kahokia. Sure. Uh, but rather because, uh, because the settings found me. And then the settings mm. kind of have these really interesting uh, themes uh, inherent to them. Uh, and I, I wanted to play with that more. So uh, Dark and Ship is the easiest example. Um, I wrote mm. the bulk of Dark and Ship uh, while deployed aboard a, a warship to the Middle East. And I, mm. uh, you know, at the time I was working a lot of night shifts. Mm. Uh, and so I was doing a lot of, you know, it's two in the morning. I'm going I'm to go down to, to the wardroom to grab some coffee. And you're walking down the passageways. And something a lot of folks don't don't realize is... Uh, at night in the in the U.S. Navy, uh, we darken the ship. Uh, the idea is the interior, all of the white lights are turned off, at least in, in the passageways. Uh -huh. um, and you turn on these very dim red lights. The idea being, if anybody opens a hatch outside the ship, 
You don't have this bright white light spilling out that could reveal your location, could reveal right. your presence to everyone with a, a pair of binoculars. So when it's two in the morning, these passageways are completely deserted. You've got the dim red lights on. It's like, boop, boop, boop. I'm just walking here. Uh, it is super creepy. Uh, right. So, and, uh, and I imagine the passageways are fairly narrow in those ships anyway. Yeah. Two people cannot pass abreast. Pass abreast. If, if you're passing someone, somebody has to kind of suck in his gut and, and brace the bulkhead uh, to let the other person squeeze past. You have to start crabbing across the hallways in order to get yes. get passageways. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. Is there a lot... That's the other thing, like, from my limited experience on boats, is that there's also some amount of, like, creaking and sounds that you are cannot easily identify. You figure that they have something to do with, like, the, the plumbing and the engineering, but they just, like, kind of come out of nowhere. Yeah, the, the first time... So, the first time I was ever on a, uh, like, a real big boy warship... I grew up I grew up on boats. Um, I mm-hmm. like I I turned five years old on a on a thirty foot sloop sailing from Washington D.C. to Sarasota, Florida. Wow! And the first time I was ever on a, a real big boy warship, I was uh, given a berth. It was an aircraft carrier. Uh, I was given a berth directly below uh, one of the catapults. And everyone who's been aboard a, a, a working aircraft carrier in the audience at this point is going like, oh, yeah, I know what that means. Uh, the catapult is the, uh, is the giant machine that grabs the front of an airplane and hurls it off the bow of the ship at a million miles an hour, oh, exaggerating somewhat, uh, yeah. because you don't have a long runway to take off of. Yeah. Uh, and what that means is the catapult is incredibly loud. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so here's here's Ensign Zimmerman trying to sleep on this aircraft carrier, uh, and just every so often, kablam, blam, 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 blam. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's just that's life on a ship. That's uh, that's excellent. So you were you were really a child of the sea. Um, that's that's a kind of poetical way of putting it. Uh, I and, so. and somewhere out there, my my the, the the hair on the back of my dad's neck is going up, saying, "Oh, he can't claim that." Uh, and you know. A rhetorical dad somewhere uh, has a point, but uh, yeah, I did right. grow up on boats, and and then you know after yeah. college I joined the navy. I've I've circumnavigated the globe. The the, the ocean has has been a part of of my life this whole time. Yeah, you, you have your sea legs. Yes, yes, there we go. Uh, right. that is absolutely the truth. Okay, good, um, good. But then for for like for the the other games, um, so um, a killing in Cahokia. I, I live right now. I, I live in in St. Louis, uh, which is right across the Mississippi from the, the archaeological site at Cahokia, which, which you can still visit to this day. It's, it's an oh. amazing place um, because Cahokia technologically was Stone Age. Uh, mm. There was a little bit of copper working for, for jewelry and, and stuff like that. Daily life, it was technologically Stone Age. I hesitate to use the phrase because like culturally, it mm. was in no way Stone Age. This was a, a real city bigger than London at the time. Uh, yeah. With you know a hierarchical social structure, complex agriculture, um, whole nine yards. But the what that means is none of the buildings have survived because the buildings all were, were were wood and, and wattle and daub. Sure. Um, but what has survived is these huge earthen mounds that the Cahokians built. Uh, these these giant. Uh, pyramids of earth. So visiting, visiting Cahokia mounds and, and, and reading about it and talking to the archaeologists there. Um, mm. One of the things that's, that's really cool thematically about Cahokia mm. is um, in the year 1050, Cahokia was just the largest of the villages near the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. Mm. And then 50 years later in 1100, it was a city, an honest to God, <laughs> real city. And it, this happened in a single human lifetime. What's so amazing about that to me is, this means that the Cahokians chose Mm -hmm. to build a city, chose to radically change their style of life. Mm -hmm. You know, you you and me, I'm an American. I assume you are are American judging by your accent. We didn't choose our society, right? Like we were born to it and we just said like, well, this is how it is. Yeah, it's here. And in... All, for almost every human being who has ever lived, that's, you know, that's how it is. But the Cahokians, they said, we're going to make a very intentional choice. Mm-hmm. And then 200 years later, by the year 1300, 
Cahokia is abandoned. There's no one living there. It's not even a village anymore. Wow. There's not even people squatting in among the ruins as far as archaeologists have been able to tell. And so what this is, is a case of, of an intentional choice followed by a, uh, a, a decline as opposed to everybody just sort of looking around one day and saying, well, forget this. This was a good idea, but no thanks. That was the, it was a 200 year decline. Yeah. Uh, but to me, that, that, that brings up thematic elements of what form should your society look like and who gets to choose? Yeah. And that's kind of the central tension that drives the action in this murder mystery Interesting. Uh, as, as you, you really get pulled in over your head. Yeah, I guess I was not very familiar with, uh, with Cahokia. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm up in New Hampshire, so we, we actually are pretty familiar with a lot of Native American cultures up here. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I guess that that's, that's a little far removed because that would be a, a completely different tribes that would have been building that. It almost sounds a little bit similar, like when you're talking about those, those mounds, similar to what they constructed in, like, Egypt with the pyramids or the ziggurats down in South America. Is it similar to that? Uh, it is similar to that in the sense that a pyramidal shape Mm. Uh, is a, a really effective way to pile things up and have them not fall down. Right. It is, it is no coincidence that if you mm -hmm. want to see something truly ancient and human built uh, and large, pyramids are, are kind of what's available. It's not that we as a species didn't build other giant things a long time ago. It's right. That's, that's what's still around. It stands the test of time. <laughs> yes. Exactly. But uh, the Kokins worked with, with what they had. Koki is in Illinois. Uh, you know, Illinois is is renowned for a lot of things, but it's it's dirt is sure one of them. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's 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 rich rich farmland, it's rich soil, and by golly, the Kokins worked with what they had, and what they had was lots and lots of dirt, and they made these incredible monuments. Yeah, it's it's not a great slogan though. We have lots of dirt. Is not <laughs> is not the kind of the, the, not a tourist attraction, I suppose. But I guess I guess that for for what they were trying to do, I suppose it was a, a really good thing. I do like the idea that they had this uh, this large city and that it was built up in a in a human lifespan. Because yeah, it it does feel like especially for if you were young before it became a city and then you saw it rise to to what it was that's got to just be an amazing experience for you to just to see civilization basically build up before your eyes yeah and uh, a, a lot of the the pcs and npcs in this in this game are people who who lived through that experience uh, and in one way or another contributed uh to the the development of this incredible achievement um, and that's, you know, that's just hardwired into the, the psyche of these characters. Yeah, I, I want to get a little bit more into that. But before we do, uh, I am kind of interested in why uh, Norse Ivory, that storyline really spoke to you. The story behind that is I was reading a, a book by, by Jared Diamond. Listeners may be uh, more familiar with, with Diamond as the author of uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Yes. He is, interestingly, a lot of folks uh, don't realize this, though. He's, he's very, very open and honest about it. Diamond is not a professional historian. He's a mm. professional ornithologist. He's a bird scientist. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, he, he writes these, these, these large, uh, very interesting uh, historical treatises. And uh, I, was, I was reading his, his book, Collapse, uh, How Societies Choose to Succeed or Fail, mm. uh, which looks at a, at a lot of collapsed societies. And as with anything in Diamond, uh, what, what he's writing is, uh, it's very interesting, it's very thought-provoking, um, and it doesn't necessarily reflect a, uh, a scholarly consensus, uh, because, of right. course, he's not a professional historian. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you read it, and, and you appreciate it for what it is. You don't take it at face value, or at least you don't take the conclusions at face value. He's, he's really good at, at presenting, like, look, this is what the archaeology has uncovered, this is what the historical texts say, like, there you can you can take him more or less at face value. The conclusions, you have to kind of take a step back and, and think about it. Um, but one of the societies that he talks about is the Greenland Norse. Mm. Uh, spoilers for Norse Ivory, uh, the, the adventure eventually takes you to Greenland. Most of, of the okay. game actually t uh, occurs on a sea voyage uh, that takes you mm -hmm. from Norway to Iceland to Greenland. Along the sea voyage, your Christianized descendants of Vikings have to share the ship with these these actual honest to goodness Norsemen, and the tension between your two groups really drives drives the plot. 
but the Greenland Norse were, were established by by famous no good guy Eric the Red, uh-huh. yes. a, a man so violent that he was exiled three times, mm-hmm. and eventually he led his followers to this this uh, this giant island that he had discovered called Greenland, and his followers were actually able to to make a living for themselves on Greenland uh, because there was walrus there. And yes, the the growing season in Greenland is about three seconds long. Uh, So it is an awful, miserable life. There are no trees, uh, which means all wood for timbers or shipbuilding or anything like that has to be imported from a world away. Uh, But what there is, is is walruses. And at the time, uh, access to Asian and African elephant ivory uh, had been cut off from Europe uh, by uh, the, the Arab conquests. Uh, okay. So people who wanted to to carve an ivory and work in ivory no longer had access to elephant ivory. The only access to ivory they had was walrus. Norway mm. was already pretty much fished out of walrus. If you wanted walrus, you had to go to Greenland. And this presented an adventure hook. Like, cool, this is a way to get player characters out to Greenland is is go and try to fetch some walrus ivory. Right. Uh, but then over over the course of centuries... Greenland Norse society kind of declined and eventually disappeared, most notably when the trade routes to Asia and Africa opened back up (laughs) and there was no reason for anyone who owned a ship to ever sail back out there. (laughs) Uh, And you have to wonder, you know, the the poor, the poor uh, Greenland Norse, what they were thinking when it's been five years since a ship last showed up. Yeah. And they're looking around and saying, we don't have the ability to produce iron out here. We don't mm-hmm. have the ability to produce timbers to build with out here. You know, every year our cows are smaller and sicklier than the year before. We don't really have the ability to produce an agricultural surplus. And they're just winnowing down their society generation after generation until there are no Greenland Norse left. And so I, I wanted to write an adventure that would that would take people out there. Uh, and I was able to use the, the walrus trade to do that. And then... Uh, the the tension between heritage and faith is just something that's really interesting because the the Norsemen you know they they conquered the Normans they conquer what is today Normandy but and become its its new nobility they become the new warrior aristocracy just like there's there's warrior aristocrats there's nobility throughout what we now call France the Normans become the nobility of of Normandy uh, and in the process. You know they they have to fit in. They they have to to behave in certain ways like other other French nobility are doing, and that means giving up Norse language. That means giving up Norse religion. That means giving up Norse culture. And for the first generation mm. or two, this is an intentional political move. Mm. By generation three or four, like no man, you've got kids growing up, you know, going to church on Sundays, being taught Latin in Sunday school. <laughs> like they're true believers, yeah. um, but they still think of themselves as something different and right. kind of casting a light on that is is a lot of fun yeah I, i'm putting myself like in the shoes of somebody who's you know from that area and thinking about like this huge economic boom that you just all of a sudden have with like the walrus trade like in a modern day we would be like oh we can see that the changing of the tides because we have you know the internet and the World Wide <laughs> web but at that time they just don't so i i can't imagine that they would even understand why like all of a sudden just no one is arriving at their shores for all they know everyone's just dead they don't know what happened yeah they got no way to know they have no way to know yeah you're just you're just cut off from from all of that information the not knowing part would be the the most horrible at least for a modern day human <laughs> it seems like yeah. the worst thing ever it it really reaches out and grabs you uh, one of the coolest archaeological uh, artifacts that's that's been found at at Brodoff Lead, which is where Eric the Red and his people settled, mm. uh, is the remains of of an iron knife. You can tell by the 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 hilt of the knife, or I guess it's it's the tang. It's the bit of metal that extends into the hilt. Mm. You can tell by the tang that this was like a full sized knife at one point, but of the blade, there's only like half an inch left because mm-hmm. uh, of sharpening. And ordinarily, you know, you sharpen your knife and you sharpen your knife and every time it loses a little bit of mass. And at a certain point you say, okay, well, this knife is now short enough that I need to go get a new knife. But these people didn't have access to new knives. So just this one working knife for cutting your food and and doing working things handed down from generation to generation. 
continuing to be sharpening until it's it's a toothpick essentially right. Uh, right. is all that's left because that little toothpick is still better than anything you have the ability to manufacture on this island. That yeah, that does uh, that does conjure up uh, almost psychologically damaging ideas. <laughs> yes, in that just this general sense of um of a winnowing of your resources of your of your agriculture of your culture just kind of going away i'm i'm really interested in and i i suppose uh as good a place to start is is sticking with norse ivory for a minute this idea of uh like the the characters that you are going to play in the scenario uh what is the generation for your player characters like in this game so the the player characters are fully pre-generated uh the games in fact do not ship with character creation rules the, here are the six pre-gens the advantage of that it allows the characters to be built in such a way uh that get right at the crux of the adventure so for right. example in in norse ivory uh you have these these six player characters and they all have kind of different relationships with the Christian faith. And they really, they run the gamut from the priest. There's, there's a priest who goes along and, and, you know, I'm not here to convert anybody, but I am here to safeguard the souls of, of my fellow Normans uh, as we go out to the very edge of the known world. Because at the time, Greenland is the furthest west thing that Europeans know to exist. And most Europeans don't even know Greenland exists. So you're, you're out on the edge of the world there. I'm going to safeguard uh, the, 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 the souls of my flock out here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then completely on the other hand, there is a uh, character whose mother very intentionally never gave up the old ways. And so she speaks, this, this player character, she speaks... Um, fluent Norse. Uh, she is, is trained in, uh, in, in how to participate in the prophetic rituals of Norse religion. Um, she doesn't necessarily get much spiritual satisfaction out of what the church teaches her. She's, she's very torn. And what's really fun about that is the game comes with a, uh, with a faith mechanic. Like I said, the, the rules are, are super simple, super stripped down. Uh, they each have kind of one, each game's rules have kind of one or two things uh, that are, are designed to uh, encourage play and incentivize play. Uh, again, towards the heart of the adventure. And in Norse Ivory, that's the faith mechanic, okay. uh, which uh, allows you to, to have and to guide a spiritual journey for your characters. To be clear, your characters are having a spiritual journey. The players are probably not having a spiritual journey. This is not, you know, conversion <laughs> therapy, the game, for God's sake. This is a <laughs> historical game. Right. Uh, by having all of these different characters that have such radically different starting points in their, their mm. relationship with the faith. You know, one of them wants to be a bishop, but doesn't really have any strong emotional attachment to the church. He just wants to be a bishop because that's the avenue towards political power that's open to him. And then encountering, you know, the course of your long sea voyage to the edge of the world, encountering a series of events that risk shaking or undermining your faith in the teachings of the medieval Catholic Church. What directions do you take that? How do your characters feel about that? How do they, they come out on the other end? It's fully possible that, that you know, you may, your faith may be strengthened by this. You've walked through the, 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 the shadow of the Valley of Death and the mm. Lord was with you. Or your faith may be destroyed by it, just utterly annihilated. Uh, I have had characters who at the end of the adventure kind of look at the, the rest of the, the Norse on their ship and say, yeah, screw these Christian guys. I'm coming home with you. Like, you guys are, are where it's at. You've got the, the real true faith. Yeah. Uh, this white Christ of Jerusalem business is a bunch of bull hockey. <laughs> and by, by having these, uh, these pre-generated characters, it ensures that the adventure and the rules and the characters are all going to sync together super well to deliver an awesome play experience. Yeah, so, uh, so you said that there's like six specific uh, pre-gen characters. Is that for each of the adventures? Yes, every adventure okay. has six pre-generated characters. Uh, okay. You, of course, do not have to play with six characters. Uh, my recommendation is is a minimum of three, uh, but I've done it with as few as two. Okay. Um, and just in my experience as a GM, once you start exceeding six characters, like things get real chaotic real fast. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. But yeah, my question was actually about like if I don't have six uh, six characters or I don't have six players, I should say. Uh, let's say I have three. Are there are, are there sp 
specific characters that are are more vital to the story than others, or could I just pick between any of those six characters to to play? Uh, you can absolutely pick any of them. Uh, okay. In no case is this like player character protagonist and his five hangers on. Like that's that's not what it is. Um, okay. There are some characters that almost always wind up getting chosen um, because. That's just how it works out. Like somebody in in a killing in Cahokia, one of the characters is a chief. One of the characters is a member of the hereditary aristocracy mm. of Cahokia. Yeah. Um, and it is almost inevitable that someone says, I want to play that guy. They just seem awesome. You kind of want to play them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, though, interestingly, I've never seen anybody fight over that guy. It's always just mm. in every party, there's always somebody who says, I want to play a guy who's at least theoretically in charge. Is he really in charge? <laughs> Yeah, that may come out and play. Um, yeah, but uh, but yeah, no. Pick pick any characters. Different character sets will just make the 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 conflicts of the game play out a little differently. Yeah. So since we're uh, since we're on mechanics, because uh, one of the things that we do talk about very heavily on the show are like mechanics and design. Uh, when it comes to the the faith mechanics that you were talking about in Norse Ivory, um, mechanically, how does that work? First off, to to kind of ease into it uh let me tell you about the the role play beat mechanic okay in norse ivory uh every character has uh four ish role play beats written on his or her character sheet uh, and they are divided into two categories you have your norse role play beats and your norman role play beats um these are, are things that are kind of integral to your character and whenever you hit one of them uh, you, you take a Benny that you can then la later spend uh, for, for mechanical benefit. But when you mark a Norse or a Norman, when you hit a Norse or a Norman roleplay beat, um, you make a tally. And then that will come into play with the spiritual progression and the faith mechanic. So in, in uh, Norse Ivory, you have four core stats, um, warrior, sage, awareness, and faith. And faith uh, which is a number from, from 1 to 10, averaging around 5, uh, represents your character's faith in the medieval Catholic Church specifically. It's not faith more broadly. It is Christian, Catholic, medieval European faith. Okay. And whenever the party encounters an event that risks shaking their faith in the medieval Catholic Church and its teachings, mm -hmm. you roll faith. You, you roll the die, you add your faith stat, and then you add the number of times you've hit a Norman roleplay beat, and you subtract the number of times you've hit a Norse roleplay beat. So if you have been roleplaying your character like a good Norman Christian choir boy, you're going to do really well on this role. If, on the other hand, you've been roleplaying your characters like, man, I'm seeing how my ancestors lived and I really like it, you're going to do really badly on this role. And the outcome of the role will then modify your faith stat um, up or down by one. Or if you roll right in the middle, it doesn't change. You know, you're able to rationalize your experiences and, and your, your faith kind of doesn't change. There's, there's several of these scenes over the course of the adventure where, you know, something happens that's really striking and really uncomfortable from the perspective of, of medieval Catholic teaching. And by the end of the game, almost everybody's faith stat has changed dramatically. Mm. Um, and people who are playing their characters, hitting a lot of Norman roleplay beats, will emerge at the end of the adventure uh, uh, much more pious than they left. On the other okay. hand, people who have been hitting a lot of Norse roleplay beats will end the adventure almost rejecting the teachings that they were brought up on. And what's really fun about this is because, man, it's your character. You get to choose whether you're hitting roleplay beats, and if so, which ones you're hitting, you get to guide your spiritual progression, even though at the end of the day it is a die roll, and so it keeps a little bit of that element of random chance. Oh, okay, that's interesting. As I'm guessing that in this particular, in these particular scenarios, there's nothing like a, a combat or initiative rolls or anything like that. It's basically all story based. Norse Ivory has two combats. Oh, okay. One is uh, a combat that occurs on, on Iceland when the characters get almost accidentally brought into uh, a blood feud that one of the crewmen on their ship is involved in. One is kind of a, a climactic final scene. Uh, that I, I don't kind of don't want to spoil there. Sure. The initial one really is uh, a quick and dirty, we're going to do a combat, really just so that when there's the climactic final combat, 
this doesn't seem weird. Like y'all are spun up on the rules. The rules are crazy simple, but it's still always nice to have a little bit of a, a tutorial moment. And it, it kind sure. of inserts itself and then gets out of the way because the point of the scene is really not like, oh, we're going to roll dice. Do we kill people? The point of the scene mm-hmm. is the story choices you make and the story uh, consequences of those choices. I guess I figured that it was probably mostly narratively based just because uh, it would stay balanced between, like, if you had three characters, four characters, six characters. When it gets to, to combats like that, do you have to think too much about, like, how many characters that you have in, in that game to make sure that it's balanced? Uh, you do, but it's super easy. Uh, the book okay. basically says, um, hey, if you have this many characters in your party, throw this many uh, Icelanders at them. Oh, good. Like, it's just, it's that simple. Uh, okay. it's, it's really straightforward. Okay, so uh, I'm having a crisis of faith, and uh, and and I'm getting a little down and dirty. Okay. So th- that's basically the mechanical system that you have built up for that. It's it's mostly based on like the faith that I am going to have by the end of the game. Yeah, the the faith mechanic and the role play beats mechanic uh, really are at, at at the heart of the rule set for Norse Ivory. Everything else is is very simple. Roll one d ten, add the appropriate stat. GM tells you whether or not you succeed. Like. That's it. And like I said, there's only four stats. This is this is not a rules-heavy system, which it, it, it has to be rules-like because it's designed for single-session play. If we're hanging around and it takes me 20 minutes to explain to you the rules, nobody's going to have a good time tonight. It really has to be like, all right, here's the rules. They're really simple. Let's tell an awesome story. Boom. Get into it, and let's let's make this happen. So, uh, is D10 your base for the for the games? Yes, all of the games are, are D10 based. It's just a single D10. D10 had kind of a, the exact amount of swing that I wanted for these games. Yeah, I know. You get into 20s and higher, and the, you start to get very, very swingy, depending on what yes. you're doing. But 10s, 10s are good. So uh, is it mostly like I have a certain number that I'm supposed to hit to determine if I succeed or fail? Correct. Uh, and in every case, the adventure just sort of helpfully spells it out for the GM. Oh, like, you know, excellent. they're going for a 13. Oh, they're going for a 13. Uh, okay. But in, in every case, it's, it's, worth, it's worth calling out. I'm a huge believer in the idea mm. uh, that failure should only be an option when it would be interesting. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> in every case, it's, you know, they roll. And if they succeed, you know, that's cool because success is always fun uh, or often fun. And if they fail... That's awesome because it presents new narrative complications. So in some ways, that's mostly GM decision for a lot of that. Yes. Uh, Yeah, no, I am never uh, averse to the idea that I failed something, especially if there's actually something that becomes interesting in that failure. You know, if if you end up with something very interesting that happens in the storyline based on that failure, I've had times where my character just critically failed on investigations. And uh, and I, I tried to eat probably what were like little fairy creatures that probably were not happy <laughs> that I tried to eat them because I thought that they were mushrooms. Delicious, delicious mushrooms. But that you know, sounds very rude. <laughs> it does sound very rude. Killing in Cahokia. Yes. What kinds of uh, mechanics are we looking at in that? What kind of characters can I look to play? Uh, a Killing of Cahokia has uh, the same roleplay beat system uh, as okay. Norse Ivory. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does not have a faith system because it that's not the sort of game it is. Like, there would be no point in having it in there. The primary rules system for Killing in Cahokia is the interrogation system. You're playing cops. You're playing members of the City Watch. You're detectives. You're investigating a murder. You're going to spend a lot of this game talking to people who don't want to talk to the police and don't want to tell you what they know. And you have to get that information out of them anyway. The, the way that uh, that works, because, uh, you know, I, I wanted the, the system to have a little bit of, of teeth, but also you know, it, it needs to, to, to hurry up and, and get out of the way the, the cool things that are going on. Obviously, because you're cops, the people you're talking to can't just get up and leave. Uh, that's not how interrogations work. And the, the core stats in A Killing in Cahokia are uh, body, rapport, uh, lies, and intimidation. Whenever you say something to someone that you're interrogating and you expect something out of them in response, it's a, it's a quick opposed check. If you succeed, they take a mood. And a mood is, is typically a single word. It's written on an index card. It may be something like uh, afraid or mollified or reassured or flattered or scared out of his mind. 
typically when, when, when you're talking and, and you force someone else to, to take a mood, it, it means that you have elicited an emotional reaction from them. Uh, and it, the GM gets to decide what that emotional reaction is, right? Like I don't yeah, tell yeah, yeah. you how to play a player character. Uh, you don't get right. to tell the GM how to play, a, play an, an NPC. NPC. <laughs> yeah. And the interrogation then concludes until a number of moods are built up such that it is clear which way this is going to go. So you're not going towards like, a, oh, and once they've gained five moods or, or anything like that, it's let's say we've got a bunch of moods on the table that are things like uh, worried, concerned, intimidated, afraid. Um, it's pretty clear where this is going to go. And, and, and as a consequence, cool, they're going to they're gonna volunteer the information they know. On the other hand, maybe they, they have, uh, maybe you've been, been rolling well, so they've been gaining moods, um, but you haven't been, been making necessarily the, 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 the wisest um, decisions in, in what you've chosen to say to these people. And so they, they're building up um, moods like reluctant, resistant, defiant. It's pretty clear they're not going to tell you anything. So we just kind of hurry up and get to the end. It's really clear you're not going to get anything out of this person. What do you want to do about it? And uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the system is designed to permit a free flow of role play because I'm, I'm a very big believer in role play should be role play. It shouldn't be a, a mechanical mini game. But by the same token, I, I wanted some element of how do we know whether we're actually going to get what we want to get out of this guy? If I end up getting these uh, people that I'm trying to interrogate into different kind of mood states, does it benefit or hinder certain things that I might try to do? Like, for instance, if uh, if I have successfully intimidated somebody, and then uh, like I try to seem like overpowering, I, I try to do more intimidating things. Do, is that more successful because they've already proven to be intimidated? Absolutely. Uh, so let's say that you have managed to give someone the mood uh, frightened. And then you decide, like, okay, I'm going to turn it up a notch. And you say something along the lines of, you know, damn it, I'm the city watch. You know, I'm judge, jury, and executioner. And, you know, if I want to, I'll have your neck. Because you're playing into that, that mood that they already have, you get a bonus on that roll. And similarly, the NPCs can try to create moods on you. Like, if they say something to you and they want something out of you in response, they also get to roll. And if they beat you, you gain a mood. Now, again, you, the player, decide what that mood is, because I, the GM, I don't get to tell you how your character responds to something. That's, that's terrible. Mm. Uh, so you decide what the mood is that you gain in response to what this person just said, but, but it did get to you at the very least. It provoked an emotional response. And if you role play in a particular way that takes advantage of that, let's exact same example, but you have the, 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 the mood uh, furious, because mm. uh, they've really gotten under your skin. Well, that's that's something that you're kind of channeling when you try to, to browbeat this guy. You gain an additional bonus to the role. Uh -huh, okay. uh, one of the things that that was really interesting to see in play, um, because I, of course, play tested the heck out of these games, I guess now would be a, a good time to mention, the book is done. My printer's proof is, is upstairs. It's, it's done. It's fully ready to go. This is about as low risk as a Kickstarter gets. Over the course of, of doing a huge amount of playtesting with these games, what was really interesting to see is that uh, some group, you know, everybody smiles and nods when you explain like, oh, you know, you can do this and get bonuses. And then some groups never touch it. Some groups are just like, that's really cool. That's good to know. And then they never say, hey, do I, I, I get a bonus for that, right? They're just perfectly happy to have the index cards on the table that say the mood. And in that case, me as a GM speaking personally, I don't force the issue. If they're perfectly happy with index cards and they don't want to get bogged down in, in getting additional bonuses, man, I'm not going to complicate the situation. I'm not going to, I'm not going to interrupt play to be like, hey, remember, because that, that kind of interrupts the flow of the story. And other groups, other groups are all about those, those, those extra bonuses, in which case, hey, man, I'm all about it, too. I'm, I'm all about whatever's, having, uh, whatever's fun for you. Yeah, it, it's kind of fun because even in these, these crazy, simple systems – there's still room for GM interpretation, which I think says something pretty fundamental about the nature of role-playing games and how, like, nobody's ever actually playing the same role-playing game as everybody else. Yeah. Like, I, I, I'm playing a game right now, and I have, uh, there's six people in our party, and most of the time it does feel like those six characters, although they are very much in the same uh, adventuring party, have very different games that they are playing <laughs> in yes. given time. Yep. Yes. 
the thing that I'm interested in too, and t- tell me if this is possible, considering that the people that you're interrogating in A Killing in Cahokia can give you moods. Yes. Is it possible that they could end up manipulating you and then all of a sudden the city watch is like, okay, I did it. I'm sorry. <laughs> like all of a sudden you, they, your, your NPCs end up pretty much destroying the PCs in the same way that you're trying to interrogate them. Boy, I'm, I'm getting real flashbacks here to your interview with Craig Campbell about, uh, <laughs> a, 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 about Capers Noir uh, with, with declaration of I was the killer the whole time. <laughs> I guess I'll give kind of a similar answer to, to what Craig gave, uh, which is, uh, to a certain extent, that's, that's up to the players and the GMs. They can't manipulate you into you actually having been the killer. None of the PCs were actually the killer. Okay. Spoiler, I guess. But if you wanted to roleplay your character that way, you could. At the end of the day, if an NPC forces you to take a mood, you get to decide what the mood is. You're the one who decides, uh, you know, how your character feels because it's your character. Uh, and if you decide, you know, this this flint is really getting into my head. I don't know what's true and what's false anymore. Like, if that's a roleplay experience that's fun for you, yeah, man, go have fun. I'm going to assume that in most of the playtesting that you did, you did not run across that scenario yourself. Uh, you would be correct. Okay. Uh, I did have one playtest where w- one of the NPCs did go into to full blown like I'm going to manipulate. Actually, in that particular mm. playtest, I had multiple NPCs go into full blown. I'm going to manipulate these city watchmen. I'm going to make them dance to my mm. tune for for my ends mm. uh, mode. In neither case did they actually succeed, but boy, they got real close. Okay. That said. Most of the, the the time, it, it does not go that way. Okay, so so let's see. So with N- Norse Ivory, it's it's mostly about faith, faith and heritage. You know what do, what does it mean to be the person that that you think you are? Okay, in Killing in Cahokia, it's mostly about like investigation and interrogation. Uh, yes, and and broader themes of what form should your society take, and who gets to make those decisions. Oh, okay, okay, excellent. So when we get to Darken Ship. What is that one shot about? So Darken Ship uh, is is less about broader themes and more about tension. Uh, it mm. really straddles the boundary between thriller and horror. Mm-hmm. And, and and boy, the, the the setting is is really perfectly lined up for it. Not only do you have you know the creepy red lights and the deserted ship and so forth, the ship itself is an incredibly intimidating environment, particularly when uh, you're super junior. And that's that's one of the things that's really fun because the players, presumably, know next to nothing about warships and naval operations and all that jazz. That's fine because the characters don't either. Mm. Uh, you know, your your training prepares you for the absolute bare minimum of what's needed to do your job. Um, most of, of your know-how, the know-how that you develop over the course of your career, is not from formal training. It's from on-the-job experience. Uh, mm-hmm. And from having experienced senior people kind of take you aside and say, like, look, let me explain to you a thing or two. And so you're in this environment where you don't know what any of this stuff is. You don't know how any of it works. You don't even know how to get around. Uh, warships are mazes. They are absolutely three-dimensional mazes. Uh, to get from one compartment to another, even if the compartments are right next to each other, like they share a bulkhead. There is there's a plate of steel that I could bang my fist on and someone on the other end could hear me banging it. And I want to get to the other side of that bulkhead. I might have to leave my compartment, go aft, go, you know, down three decks, go very far forward, go up two decks, go aft again, go up one more deck and then go aft again. And as a consequence, if you not only do you have to know where it is you want to go, you also have to know how to get there. And, and, and there's no map. Like, this is not a mapping game. You either know or you don't. And your character sheet kind of lists out, look, here's some places that you know how to get to and reliably access. For example, just because you may know how to get to the armory doesn't mean you can get in the armory. The armory is kept locked for obvious reasons. But every player character has a different set of uh, compartments that she can uh, reliably find and access. And as you are trying to piece together the mystery 
of what happened here and what, if anything, can you, you, you don't know your port from your starboard. You don't know your forward from your aft. You know, you're trying to, to piece together what happened and, and what, if anything, can, can be done about it. And as you're moving from compartment to compartment, trying to find uh, some indication of what's going on, A, uh, you are being hunted. You are being hunted through the passageways by mysterious apparitions in, in, in ways that you may or may not be able to deal with. And the ship itself is, is, is a full character in this adventure because the ship is still doing things. Like, just because everybody is gone doesn't mean the ship has said, like, oh, I'm going to go to bed now. Like, everything's going to be fine. Like, no, man, a ship is a 24-hour thing. Like, it's not, oh, it's, it's 9 p.m. Everybody's going to go to bed. We're just going to sort of turn down the ship and everybody's going to get up at, at, you know, 7 in the morning and, and resume stuff. No, the ship's 24 hours. The ship's still going. The ship's still doing things. And the decisions that you make over the course of the adventure will impact the ship. And, and it's, it's just, it's about that, that slow increase of tension as things progressively get worse and worse and worse. But you may figure out how to do something about it. That, you know, I've seen playtest groups where, you know, they, they manage to save the ship. I've also seen playtest groups where we end in a TPK. And that's, that's the nature of horror is if there's no chance of failure, it's not horror. Right. So a lot of what I'm doing in this particular scenario for, for these very, very green sailors that I'm playing, uh, a lot of it has to do with navigation and almost problem solving, trying to figure out how I get to places and, and get into areas. Yes, uh, there, there's a fair amount of problem solving. There's a fair amount of, of okay. puzzling. One thing uh, that, that I'll, I'll mention here. Uh, this might be a good place for the GMs of the world to say, but I don't know anything about ships or naval operations. <laughs> Relax. Just like in the other two adventures, uh, the, the, the game presents you with fully all of the information you need to run it and none of the information you don't. I'm, I'm not here to, to drown you in, you know, what does a deployment rotation look like? Why do you go once over dust, twice over rust? Uh, in the case of North Ivory and Killing Koki, I'm not here to drown you with, na uh, with, with dates and proper nouns and whatever, because none of that's going to come up in play. Uh, it's just sure. what you need to run and, and nothing else to distract you. Okay, so how far down the, the history rabbit hole did you have to go for this? <laughs> it feels like this, this might have taken quite a bit of research. Uh, I mean, sure. You know, I, I absolutely want to make sure that, that I'm presenting things well. Uh, that's particularly the case in, in a, the, in, for a killing in Cahokia. Uh, you know, historically in gaming, you know, Native American characters have, have not been well represented. And when they have been represented, they've been represented often using, uh, you know, kind of pernicious stereotypes. Uh, and mm -hmm. so in, in the case of all of these games, but especially killing in Cahokia, it was very important that I did my research. And, you know, for, for killing in Cahokia, uh, it was reading a lot of scholarly stuff. Uh, spending a lot of time at the site, talking to, to multiple archaeologists. Uh, it's one of the, the interesting details about Cahokia. It's not actually possible to, to talk to modern Cahokians because there is not a living native group that, you know, publicly and proudly claims descent from Cahokia. Uh, the word Cahokia oh. itself is actually... Mm the name of a band of the Alini nation that were living in the area when Europeans first showed up. Oh, okay. But when Europeans asked, like, hey, man, like, there's a whole bunch of giant earthen mounds around here. What is the <laughs> deal? The, the response of, of the Cahokia band was, hey, man, I don't know. It was like that when we got here. <laughs> we, we got here, and this is what we found. <laughs> yeah, this, this was already here, like, we're with you. This is super cool, huh? Yeah, it's very sweet. What, uh, what, what the, the archaeological, genetic, and linguistic, uh, and for that matter, folkloric evidence suggests is that as Cahokia faded, uh, the people who lived there uh, migrated west in a, in a great diaspora and either became or joined in the modern Suin nations. But as far as I've been able to, to tell, that's not super important to the, uh, the identities of, of modern Suin peoples. And so ordinarily, research would, would include talking to actual living Native people to make sure that, that their opinions and, and that their uh, perspectives, more importantly, 
uh, are, are being well represented. That's not possible uh, with Cahokia. It really is a, a, an archaeological thing. But with the case of, of Cahokia and with, uh, with Norse Ivory, both of those games are intended to fit between the pages of history, that nothing in them contradicts any known historic facts, as, as near as I was able to determine. And it, this could have very easily been a thing that happened and was simply never written down. Because I, I get this, uh, I think one of the common threads that I'm seeing between these stories is that there is a certain sense of isolation in all of them. Like, these are sort of, like, places where it feels like they're they're sort of just outside of time in some ways. Like, they they seem like they are stories with people who are sort of cut off from the rest of the world. Uh, I agree with you for, for Norse Ivory and Darkened Ship. Cahokia, both historically and, and presented as such in the game, uh, Cahokia was, was part of a continental trading network. One of the player characters, mm. one of the pre-generated characters uh, in A Killing in Cahokia is actually a, a merchant who has been all over the continent and has decided in his old age, like, man, I can't keep living out of a canoe. Like, <laughs> these old bones won't support it. Uh, I'm going home. And, and this watch position is just going to be sort of a quiet little sinecure for me in my twilight years. But so, so his perspective in particular, and all of the characters in The Killing in Kokia have secrets, uh, and his secrets are kind of tied into this, this continental perspective that he has. But he has, he has a, a much larger perspective than most of the other characters in the game, both player and non-player. And uh, that kind of serves to, to help tie Kokia more broadly into, into this, uh, this, this larger world. I see. Okay. But technically, we don't uh, we don't really know what native tribe would have originally made those those earthen mounds. Ah, uh, so this gets into to interesting questions of of definition because you can call them, for example, what they're usually referred to uh, is is Mississippians, and we can say, well, of course we do. You know, they were built by the Mississippians, but we also define Mississippians as them people who built them mounds. You know. And so, like, how much do you have to know about a culture before you're able to say, like, oh, we know this culture? It's just, it's, it's, it's a question that I'm not sure has a hard and fast answer. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, it is a, it is a fascinating idea, though. So, but, but Cahokia, the name that we get is actually from the people that the Europeans had found there yes. when they got down to that area. Okay. Yes, uh, and, and actually, continuing to go down this Kokia rabbit hole, which I'm very happy sure. to be down, yeah. all of the proper nouns in the game, a killing in Cahokia, uh, are not mm -hmm. true. They are okay. either names used by modern archaeologists, uh, for example, Cahokia itself, or the long-nosed god, a deity that we know from, um, from art that, that we've found, or uh, they, are, they are purely descriptive. Uh, for example, uh, the largest mound in Cahokia is, is known today as the Monk's Mound, because a band of uh, Trappist monks uh, built a small settlement on it at one point. That wouldn't make any sense in a Cahokian context, so I called it the King's right. Mound. Or... Uh, they are, in the case of the names of characters, uh, they are the names of real historical era Suin peoples. Because like I said, the, the Suin peoples are, are the closest link that we have to, to the ancient Cahokians, which is objectively wrong. It's like setting a game in pre-Roman right. Britain and naming all the characters things like Henry and William after <laughs> kings from a thousand <laughs> years later. Like it's just, it's just yeah. wrong. But it's also right. a, it's also way better than nothing, right? Right. It's the only reference point we have. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and exactly. it certainly beats the heck out of naming them all like horrible things, like you know, Red Cloud or Big Bear. Like, boy, we right. <laughs> want to stay about as far away from that as as humanly possible. Right. Because we don't really know what what they would have been called or what their naming conventions would be. Sure. So. And uh, you know, side note: Trappist monks make the best jam. I have never, I didn't know Trappist jam existed. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly oh, familiar yes. with Trappist beers, but oh. uh, I didn't know oh, they made yes. jam. Oh, yes, they certainly do. Uh, yeah, no, Trappist, the, the Trappist monks do, do can jams and jellies, and they sell them all over the place. Wow, you might have to check that out. Yeah, they make wonderful stuff. I think that's mostly what I'm familiar with. 
I didn't actually know that they did any kind of like brewing. Yeah, um, I didn't know that. I, I would argue that that's what they're they're best known for. But hey, maybe they're best known for jams. Like I don't know. Um, I, maybe it's a regional thing. I come from New England, so maybe it's a New England thing that we just we just know that. I don't know. Yeah, as far as but, I'm aware, the Trappist order originates in Belgium, uh, and there's mm. there's something like a half dozen Trappist monasteries in Belgium, and they all produce mm. their own brand of beer. The uh, the the one that's easiest to get in the states is is Chimay C H I M A Y. They're all great beers. I mean, just absolutely terrific. Oh, that's interesting. I'm glad that they've diversified what they make. That's very <laughs> yes. I've learned something today. So I was kind of interested. Like, this is not the first book that you've put out through Molten Sulfur Press. There have been some others. It feels like they're very historical based too. Am, am I right in that assumption? Can you tell me a little bit about your previous work? Yes. So uh, this is actually my third Kickstarter. Uh, I'll take the moment to make a quick pitch. Uh, all of my previous Kickstarters have delivered the core reward on time. Uh, I'm very confident this one is, uh, will as well. You know, Molten Sulfur Press has a track record and it is a track record of, of reliability. The uh, the previous two books are the GM's Real World Reference and uh, its spiritual sequel, Archive, Historical People, Places, and Events for RPGs. They are both collections of NPCs, adventure sites, and adventure books ripped out of real history and the real world, uh, complete with advice on how you can file the serial numbers off of them and drop them into your fictional campaign. I have found that basing your game uh, material on stuff from the real world lends it a richness and a verisimilitude that uh, players really grab hold of, even if they don't know, even if they don't realize that it's it's based in, in something real. Uh, it's just, it's richer and they, they appreciate it and they, they recognize it. There's a certain genuine nature to it. Like there's a familiarity that you may not even realize you have with it because it comes out of history. Exactly. Like the... Uh, humans were, were all very different and the past is a foreign country. They do things differently right. there, but yet despite all of our staggering diversity as, as a species, uh, the human experience is universal and mm -hmm. you recognize that human experience when you see it. Uh, it, it speaks to yeah. you on a, on a certain level, even if you're not consciously aware of it. Right. The motivations and the storylines and everything feel similar, even if they are out of time. Exactly. They are going to speak to you in the present, yeah. Uh, I also put out uh, weekly gaming content uh, on the, the Molten Sulfur blog. It's free weekly gaming content, uh, all drawn from real history, real folklore, and real science. So you can you can check that out at ModelsUlfur.com. It's very similar to the, the two earlier books, just in a free weekly serialized format. I do want to talk a little bit about the, the Kickstarter itself. Um, begins on May seventh. Do you know what you're looking for, for, for goals, for stretch goals? Tell me a little bit about what you are, are looking forward to in the Kickstarter. So the initial goal is uh, $1,500. Uh, that's what I need for uh, to, to really get it out to the printers. And all I need to do is tell the printer go. Like they've got all the files ready. They've got everything all queued up. And of course the PDFs, as soon as the financials clear through Kickstarter, which can take about a month, uh, but as soon as the, the financial's clear, PDF's out to, to everyone who, who backed, PDFs are ready to go. For stretch goals, uh, initial stretch goals are going to, to consist of uh, kind of supplementary materials, aids for the, the existing three games, things like name tents with artwork on them, stuff like that. However, uh, I've got three more games, three more one-session games, queued up all in different degrees of completeness. One of them is about halfway through playtesting. One of them is researched but not written. One of them is, is the, the, the third and final, is, is sketched out but not researched. And uh, boy, if we, if we really knock it out of the park, uh, you know, free additional games for everybody, right? All the backers get free PDF copies of, of more games, uh, and you could potentially double the amount of, of games that you get for your money. Boy, I really hope we get to that level. Like, that would be really terrific. But as of this recording, the Kickstarter hasn't started. I have no idea how this is going to go. Boy, I really hope it goes well because I put a lot of work into this. I, I hear you. Um, are, you are you able to give me a, a brief overview of what those potential adventures are, are going to be? Uh, so I can, I can give you a little bit of, uh, of a teaser, uh, just a, okay. a brief little teaser for the first one, uh, which is that it is a mystery and a heist in a 
Prohibition-era gangland setting that unless you live in a very particular part of the country, uh, you've not only never heard of, it has never occurred to you could be a gangland setting before. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that does pique my interest a bit, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's that's your little teaser. That's that's the teaser I got. Well, hey, you know what? Maybe that will encourage people to try and get you to those stretch goals, because they're, they're going to want to know what that is. So. Fingers crossed. <laughs> As, as we're kind of like wrapping up, I did want to ask you a question. Like, if, if I'm a GM, for instance, and I get my hands on making history, do you have any advice for me on how I, something that I should remember when I'm trying to run one of these one session RPGs? The big thing I would tell you is uh, don't sweat the details. Okay. You know, in some of the, the blind play tests uh, where, you know, you, you send it out to other people, they run it, they record the session, they send it back. In some of the other play tests, uh, I've had people whether GMs or players, uh, kind of get hung up on historical details. Uh, like, for example, Norse Ivory, did uh, do these events occur before or after the Crusades began uh, was something that somebody was really concerned about. Nobody at the table immediately knew the answer. If it's relevant, the book will say it. Uh, if the book doesn't say it, um, you know, ask if somebody at the table knows the answer. If nobody knows the answer, Google it. Uh, if Google doesn't yeah. give you an answer in 60 seconds... Ask what would be a good answer, and congratulations, that's now canon at your table. Your high school world history teacher is not going to come to your house and been like, ah, you got the dates wrong on this one, Summit Sunny Jim. Like, <laughs> just have a good time yeah. with it. it. It's interesting because I am starting to realize, okay, so that's 994 AD, so we are right around the time of the Crusades. But I wouldn't think that as far as, like, the Vikings are concerned or, or any of that area, that it would really be effective for them. Like, I, I, that's not really the region where the Crusades are happening. I don't even know if they would be aware of the Crusades. <laughs> so uh, to, to go down a historical rabbit hole here, uh, the Crusades have not yes. started yet. Um, when they do start, they wind up having a large impact on both the Normans and the Norsemen. Uh, the Normans, because the, by the time the Crusades kick off, the Normans are fully Christianized. Uh, and so you have a number of notable Norman leaders participating sure. in the Crusades as full and enthusiastic members. Uh, and okay. for the Norsemen, by the time the crusade, uh, of the Crusades, uh, the Viking Age has kind of wound down. Vikings and, and Norsemen more broadly aren't a huge player on the scene anymore, but they are still there. It's not like they just fell off the map. Uh, and as major traders with a strong connection to Constantinople, uh, through which most of the Crusades flowed and one of the Crusades sacked, they absolutely, they have skin in this game. Ultimately, in Norse Ivory, it's all irrelevant because by 994, like, the Crusades haven't started. But, uh, and then there's there's additional Crusades that that we as a, a culture that, that tends to focus on Western Europe kind of overlook. There are Crusades into Eastern Europe. Like, there are Crusades into the Baltic states that are that are legit Crusades because there's still a whole bunch of pagans up in up in the Baltic. Uh, and... Bunch of Catholics are real grumpy about that fact, uh, and are, are sending sending crusades up to convert some folks by by fire and the sword. D digging into the crusades is a a, a very long and complex issue. Yes, <laughs> to get into. I I once studied it for like a a year, uh, as a with with an English uh, history professor who is definitely uh, far smarter than I hope to be, but um, we had actually taken it. Mostly from the main conflict. We, di we didn't really uh, get into to, like the Eastern European blocks and all of that. Um, but the one half of the year, we had studied it from the Muslim side and one half from the Christian side. And looking at what those two conflicting uh, ideal idealisms <laughs> essentially end up being for the Crusades. But when you start to realize how many different facets there are mm -hmm. and how complex it is, you start to realize, yeah, boy, this is a lot more than than just that. Just the idea of the mercenaries alone. Yes. When you start to think about that whole aspect, it's just like, I don't even know what's happening anymore. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's so much bigger and more complicated than, than what we teach our children in grade school, yeah. right? Like we teach them this very simple <laughs> concept and it's like, no man, this, this occurs over centuries and, and humans yeah. are involved with it and therefore it is necessarily going to be crazy complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yep. In terms of, to answer the question that we didn't really need to answer, but it's good that we answered it anyway, as far as Norse Ivory goes, it would be before the Crusades. Yes. So they really wouldn't have any reference point for yes. it. Kickstarter happens on May 7th. Goes for a, a month? One month uh, through One June month? 6th. 
June 6th. Okay, excellent. So uh, if you want to make history yourself, why not check it out? Tristan, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm deeply grateful. Oh, no, no problem whatsoever. I'm, I like to learn about history myself. So uh, I'm always fascinated when it, when it comes up in uh, subject matter. If, uh, if folks out there on the Internet wanted to learn more about molten sulfur or about making history, uh, where could they go? Uh, so my recommendation uh, for, for making history, go to the Kickstarter page. Uh, for Molten Sulfur more, more broadly, uh, check out the blog. It's at moltensulfur.com. Just Google Molten Sulfur, and it'll, it'll take you right there. I'm, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. At Twitter, I'm at Molten Sulfur. On Facebook, it's Molten Sulfur Press. Check us out. We'd, lo we'd love to have you. And uh, I really, really hope that, that you uh, folks out there in, uh, in podcast land really get a kick out of this product. And uh, as far as we're concerned, also make sure that uh, you go and check out DelveCast.com. All of our projects are over there. We have so many different things we try to do on, on, on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, and uh, make sure to check us out on Patreon. We have some uh, wonderful exclusives, some unedited full episodes before I get to my editing fingers. Uh, and, uh, and some additional content that you won't get anywhere else, make sure to uh, click on that Patreon banner. Even if you're not a patron, we have some wonderful stuff over there for you for some of our upcoming projects that we're just kind of feeling out and want to get some feedback on. Thank you to our Shiny Level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. You keep the digital lights on. Uh, and, of course, you can find us on all kinds of podcast apps, including iTunes, Google Play, uh, Spotify, pretty much everything. Go go everywhere. You'll find us there. You can also find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. Uh, Tristan, is there any social media uh, sites where they could visit you for Molten Press? Or uh, so I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. On Twitter, I'm at uh, Molten Sulfur. On Facebook, I'm Molten Sulfur Press. I think that we made a little bit of history today uh, on this interview. And uh, again, I want to thank Tristan Zimmerman from Molten Sulphur Press for being on. You know, once again, no, no, the thanks goes entirely in the other direction. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply grateful to be here. Uh, thank you. You are welcome. And uh, for all of us here at Delft, uh, thank you for joining us, and we will see you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Good night, everyone. <laughs>